Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. You know that look you get when you're talking to, I don't know, a creationist about the fact of evolution or the problems with these ideas of intelligent design, which we're going to get into today with Dr. Abby Hafer. You get that superior stare from someone who's completely and obviously unaware of the fact that they are not as smart or competent as they think they are. Well, psychologists, of course, call this the Dunning-Kruger effect. It goes far beyond religion. I mean, we ever known a bad driver who thought they were a great driver? Anti-vaxxers ignorant about the science of vaccines? A president who says he's better at almost everything than everyone? Dunning-Kruger's everywhere, but it's just one in a long list of pitfalls when it comes to reasoning. And a great defense against bad reasoning is understanding how we reason, how we think, how opinions and arguments are formed, and how good and bad information gets processed. The Great Courses Plus has a whole lecture series with Dr. Stephen Gimbel. It's called An Introduction to Formal Logic. And it helped me, and it will help you, learn more about the role of logic in course-correcting our own brain. It's just one of over 9,000 lectures to choose from on subjects ranging from science to history to cooking to the arts, streaming to your smartphone, laptop, TV, tablet, or available in podcast form via the Great Courses Plus app. Sign up now for The Great Courses Plus. Take advantage of a terrific limited time offer, a full and free month of unlimited access to the entire lecture library if you use my special URL. Learn stuff and become a sharper thinker when you start your free month right now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. Looks like I'm going to Los Angeles. I had an invitation I just couldn't pass up to join Cara Santa Maria and Matt Dillahunty at the Wilshire Ebell Theater. I hope I'm saying that right in L.A. And while I've done a ton of events around L.A., I don't think I've actually done anything in Los Angeles specifically. So I'm excited. This is going to be amazing. I'll put the ticket link in the description box if you want to go to that. But I look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. Looks like I'm going to be in the Akron area in Ohio in June. Looks like I'm going to be part of the Ark Encounter protest in Kentucky. You know, they do a protest on the anniversary of the Ark Encounter opening every year. (laughs) Did you see the article that was posted by Hemet Mehta on the 10th of April? Ken Ham can't find enough creationist employees So he's loosening restrictions. Now, remember, in the past that Ken Ham said in order to work for the Creation Museum in the Ark Encounter, you had to include a salvation testimony. I've been saved through Jesus Christ, said the salvation prayer. I had to say I'm a young earth creationist. They actually have a belief statement you got to sign. You have to confirm that you agree with the answers in Genesis' statement of faith, which gets into how you frame marriage and sexuality and blah, blah, blah. But Ken Ham, under these guidelines that he set out, has had apparently had trouble getting enough employees to work the place. And so I guess they have eased those restrictions. There was a Facebook Live video, and he's speaking to someone. He says, uh, we are a Christian organization. As a Christian organization, we employ people who are Christians. We actually, for the seasonals, we actually have a more abridged statement of faith. The fundamentals of Christianity, not our detailed one for all of our full-time managers and others. So for seasonals, I know there's a lot of young people who still aren't necessarily mature in all their thinking in lots of areas, but if they can sign the tenets of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, they can work here. And as Hemet said in the article, he said, all right, great, you're not real Christians who accept the Bible like Ken Ham does, but he's going to throw you a bone and give you a job anyway. <laughs> Oh, the Ark Encounter. You know, it's amazing to me to watch this guy, an enterprise that is supposedly endorsed by and sanctioned by God, and yet the God who created the universe who was more powerful than anyone, anywhere, at any time, 
apparently can't keep a Christian business solvent or keep employees on the payroll. It just seems like kind of a basic if you're God. Seems like you'd be able to handle that. Like, create the cosmos, keep a business running smoothly. I mean, the second one seems much easier to me. I'm just saying. I mean, that's just an observation here from your heathen radio host. All right, enough of that. Let's get into today's conversation with Dr. Abby Hafer. I remember being in the faith, a devout Christian, and looking around thinking so much complexity, so many perfectly designed creatures and living things. and It's just proof of an intelligence. It didn't occur to me that there might be some lack of intelligence in the way things out there were put together. And yet, Dr. Abby Hafer has authored a book called The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, Why Evolution Explains the Human Body and Intelligent Design Does Not. Oh, Dr. Hafer, if we'd met 20 years ago, <laughs> hell, 15 years ago, I'd have just pitied you. I'd have said, oh, you poor thing. You poor educated person. If only you'd just taken it on faith. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Hafer, you're a biologist and an educator, but let's go deeper for the audience who may not be familiar with you and your work. What's your background? What do you do? What I do these days for a living is I teach human anatomy and physiology at a little college in Massachusetts called Curry College. My background in biology in terms of my education is that I have a bachelor's degree in biology from Swarthmore College and then a DPhil, a doctorate in zoology from Oxford University. Let's talk about the concept of design or unintelligent design from the perspective of the human body. I mean, the way the body is put together, it just seems like there is design in place. So tell me about some examples of not-so-intelligent, quote-unquote, design within the human body. Well, I'm actually going to back up a little bit on that because this is a fun story and it's completely true. Quite a few years ago, call it 10 or so, I realized that evolution is not a scientific controversy or a scientific issue at all. It's a political issue. And of course, that political issue is driven by religion, but it is basically a political issue. And when I realized that, I realized why it was not getting traction as much as it should for something that works so well in science. And that is simply that scientists are very bad at political speech. Arguments that work in the political arena are different. They need to be short and easy to understand and easy to repeat. And there can be a lot of complicated thinking behind them and scholarly papers behind them. But you have to be able to reduce it to talking points and things that will fit onto a poster. And this is just not the way that scientists operate. It actually goes against our training to do that. So I sort of gave myself the assignment of, well, what would a political argument for evolution even look like? Since it's a political issue, how are we going to do this? So anyway, I just kind of put the idea on the back burner, didn't really actively think about it. But nonetheless, the idea was in my head, and I teach human anatomy and physiology. So one day, there I was in front of my class teaching physiology as I do, and we were talking about reproductive systems. And uh, we, I had just put the male reproductive system on the whiteboard and had drawn it there and pointed out that the testicles hang outside the abdomen. They hang outside the body. And I asked the class if anybody knew why the testes hang outside the body. And there's usually somebody who knows. So I put the question to them. And sure enough, somebody knew. And I turned around and I wrote down the basic thing on the board, which is that the testicles have to be cooler than normal body temperature in order to produce sperm. So they have to hang outside the body to stay a little bit cooler. But as I was writing it down and I was writing that the testicles have to be cooler than normal body temperature, I looked at it there and I thought, you know, that's really bad design. Who thought of that? And I realized right there in front of the class that I had my first best argument against intelligent design in the human body 
because once I started talking about men's testicles, people would pay attention. <laughs> I have to ask you, though. I mean, you know, we're all friends here. I mean, <laughs> where would you put them? If you're not putting them outside the body, where what would be a better design, Dr. Hafer? Well, the better design would be making warm body temperature and sperm production compatible. Have them inside the body where they would be protected. The testes, as men undoubtedly experience, are in a very vulnerable position. Oh, yes. uh, you, can, you can speak to that better than I can. <laughs> I'm just saying this is, has provided the genesis for countless YouTube videos, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just not a, right. not a good thing. It, it's really, I mean, you know, very bad positioning there. You just have to admit it. Um, you know, men suffer all sorts of inconvenience and risk severe pain and worse because of this unfortunate positioning. And I thought to myself, one would think that God could do better. So, as I said, it turns out that lots of other animals actually got better, or I should say more protected, testicles. Of course, cold-blooded animals like frogs have internal testes. But it turns out that lots of warm-blooded, that is to say animals with a nice warm body temperature like ours, also have internal testicles. So it's actually possible. And this includes rhinoceroses, it includes elephants, it includes all marine mammals, you know, whales and porpoises and the like. And it also includes all birds. And birds actually have higher body temperature than we do. And all of them have internal testes. And so, you know, if we were supposed to have been made in God's image, we kind of wonder why we got the stuff that which is pretty clearly suboptimal and where an alternative is possible. It is possible to have warm body temperature and internal testes, but human males didn't get that, which definitely doesn't indicate that we are God's favorite, if you see what I mean. I'm reminded of someone had posted something somewhere, maybe it was uh, Facebook or Twitter, and they'd said, you know, if if you were really God's will, if your life, if the creation of the soul at the moment of conception, if this was really destiny, why all of those millions of other sperm? <laughs> right. And that's I true. thought first, I thought, you know, that's actually a really good observation. Are there any other aspects to the human reproductive system or cycle that aren't really the most efficient or effective? Well, there are a lot of them, actually. I love the idea of all those sperm. I hadn't thought of that one before, but here's a really, really sad one. At least I should say, if you are an evangelical or if you are a fundamentalist, ask yourself, why all those embryos? Because miscarriage is something that happens. And more to the point, Lack of implantation is something that happens. There is now good research out there that shows that about one quarter of all of the eggs that get fertilized, so the sperm actually meets the egg and it turns into what we call a zygote, that zygote then makes its way to the uterus. It, it's sort of you know pulled along by a current created inside the fallopian tubes by some cilia. Anyway, it winds up in the uterus. And if it doesn't implant on the uterine lining relatively quickly, then that's the end of the pregnancy. And that fertilized egg washes out with the menstrual fluid at that time of the month. And that is the fate of about 25% of all fertilized eggs. And there's another few percent of fertilized eggs that do manage to implant on the lining of the uterus, but then fail to fully gestate for a whole host of reasons. But this means that there are a large number of fertilized eggs that do not make it to becoming a fully developed baby. And that does not have to do with abortion that humans get. It has to do with that which happens in the body naturally. You can say that some of those miscarriages are a tragedy, but many of them are things that the people are not even aware of. The pregnancy has not gotten that far along. We know this from hormonal studies. 
but you simply got to ask them. 25% of all embryos never even implant on the uterine lining, which means that if you believe that fertilized embryo has a soul from the moment that sperm meets egg, it means that it is this human soul for a few days. It never experiences anything of human life, and then it's washed out with the menstrual fluid, and that's the end of its life. It lives a few days, and then it dies, and that's it. If you look at the research, God is the world's busiest abortionist. And so, you know, you want to ask about why all those sperm, you can ask why all those embryos. Why do all those embryos get made, have virtually no experience, certainly no conscious experience, and then die? And these arguments, the evolution of the eye, the miracle of the eye, it's become almost a tried argument. I'm sure you've been through this. I'm going to make you go through it again, Dr. Hafer. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, it's ripe for discussion. One of the arguments we hear from people like Ken Ham, as he's wearing glasses, corrective lenses, by the way, is that when you look at the eye, well, it's obviously perfectly designed. It could not have evolved. So educate us, if you would, about the eye, the pluses, the pros and the cons, okay? Well, there are two different parts to that question. People often don't quite realize that, but there's two different parts to that question. One is, how did the eye evolve? And the other then is, is it that well designed anyway? And I put design in big quotes here, meaning uh, laid out or the way that it's put together. But let's start with the evolution of the eye, because that's in many respects kind of the more fun part. Because all kinds of creationists and intelligent design folks will say that the eye could not possibly have evolved from a simpler structure. And that is simply and verifiably, scientifically, provably not true. Because there are lots and lots of simple eyes existing in nature right now, today, you can go out and find them yourself. Let's start at the very, very basic level, which is the perception of light. All vision is more or less perception of light to a greater or lesser degree or to a finer and finer accuracy. So the ability to see, say, a face is actually pretty well focused ability to see light. But the basics of vision is light perception. And light perception can be explained in the following way. It's really simple. You've experienced it yourself. Colors bleach in the sun. If you have a favorite shirt that you wear when you're working outdoors or this kind of thing, you know that colors bleach in the sun. And vision is based on the fact that some colors bleach really, really quickly in the sun, so quickly that that information can be used to tell an organism where light is. So you can have single-celled organisms, no joke here, single-celled organisms, no eye, no anything, that have a little patch of photopigment, as it's known, basically this color that bleaches rapidly in the sun. And that little batch of photopigment then tells the organism where light is, which is handy to them because some of them, for instance, are photosynthetic. And so they want to orient themselves towards the light in order to get energy in order to survive. So the point is that's the basis of vision is these photopigments. And you can have a visual system that works that takes up less than one cell. That is very simply a little patch of photopigment in a single-celled creature. So that's a pretty darn simple eye. I'm trying to think back to my own reading about it. Was it called the, I'm going to say it wrong probably, is it euglena? Is that right? Euglenas are one organism that has a patch of photopigment. There are others as well. Uh, I've given talks about these from time to time. I have euglenas in my book because euglenas also have chloroplasts, that is to say they're photosynthetic. So they kind of break all the rules that we like to think about when it comes to what's a plant and what's an animal because they have this ability to detect light They have the chloroplasts so that they can do photosynthesis. And then they have a cilia that they swim around so they can orient their chloroplasts towards the light. So they're sort of this wonderful mix and match of an organism. 
So your explanation is actually one of the better ones I've heard as far as how does the eye itself begin to develop. You're saying that the cells will organize to the optimal point where they can receive the most light to detect the most light. And that provides sort of the starting point, the foundational, the genesis, if you will, of the more complex eye. Right. What happens after that, when you start getting into animals made up of more than one cell like us, but, you know, also like, oh, you know, sea creatures of all different kinds and things like that, what you start seeing is not just a little patch of photopigment, but several cells that are photosensitive. So now you have, you know, a little cluster of photosensitive cells. That's really nice. But now here's where a little bit of really simple physics comes in. Imagine, and this is all in my book, by the way, and I have lots of pictures in my book. But what happens after that is that now imagine instead of those cells just being on a flat surface, imagine them being in a little bit of a depression. And now there's light that's overhead, right? But the point is that if these cells are at the bottom of a little bowl, then the organism is now going to get some sense of the direction that the light is coming from, depending upon which cells are receiving the light and which ones are not. Is this making sense? It is. It's almost like a, kind of a radar dish kind of a thing. If yeah. there is one portion that is receiving more of a signal, then it helps you determine the source of the signal. Correct. So now you put them in a deeper dish and you're going to get a much better sense of the direction that the light's coming from. And then as that dish gets a narrower and narrower top, then you start getting into the fun world of pinhole cameras. Have you ever played with a camera obscura or at the eclipse last summer, did you poke a hole in a piece of cardboard in order to see the eclipse projected on a surface behind it? We did indeed. Well, you know, the, the way that that pinhole worked was that it was projecting the image of the sun onto that surface, but it was going through that tiny little pinhole, which means that you can get a reproduction of the image. So you saw this eclipse taking place. It was an image of the eclipse due to the fact that when light goes through a very small hole, you can wind up getting an image this way. Now, once you have an image, you've got an eye. And then after that, you, and, and this is all, by the way, all you see eyes of all the different varieties I was just telling you about in the world of invertebrates in various different clams and snails and things like that that don't have backbones. You see eyes of all the different levels of complexity that I was just talking about. Then it's not that hard to then have a covering on this pinhole which can help it in various ways, but then as it grows in certain ways, it becomes more of a lens which can focus the light further. And the next thing you know, you've got an eye. I mean, an eye like our eye. They are all eyes, but they're just eyes of different levels of complexity. And building an eye through all of these different levels of complexity, the really cool thing here, and the thing to emphasize is that they all work. Every single eye at every stage of complexity works in that it gives its possessor a little bit of a benefit in the natural world. You know, having a little bit of ability to detect where light is helps the animal to survive. So it's a good thing. Our ability to detect images, however badly we do it, definitely helps us get by in the world. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be better than the alternative, which is no vision. I heard Julia Sweeney say once in response to the question, well, what good is half an eye, which is an ID argument, intelligent design right. argument. And she's like, well, it's, it's about half as good, <laughs> which, you know, when you think about it, you're like, well, actually, yeah, it's about half as good. Would you agree? Well, actually, I'm going to put that a little bit different. I've heard that argument before. Oh, God, I ask a biologist a biology yeah. question, and now I'm going to I'm going to pay. All right, hit no, me. No, no, you're not going to pay that much. <laughs> um, okay. here's, here's, how, here's how I look at it. You say, what good is half an eye? What are you going to do, saw an eye in half? That's like saying, okay, so I have a dog. If I cut the dog's head off and it dies, that means that the dog can't have evolved from a simpler creature. That's not the way it works. Yeah. It's basically saying, okay, so you injure an organism 
that is working well, that is alive, that has evolved to work in a certain way, you injure it and then you say, see, it doesn't work. That means it couldn't have evolved. It's just wrong. The point is complex organisms evolve from simpler organisms and complex eyes evolve from simpler eyes. There's a difference between a simple eye and a half an eye, a half of your eye or my eye. Talking here with Dr. Abby Hafer, who is a biologist, an educator, and an author. If you were in control of all things, Dr. Hafer, mm -hmm. and you were to give us the eye, would you give us the eye of another creature, you know, like an eagle or something? Well, it's certainly true that there are lots of animals that have vision that's better than ours. But let's start out with something a little bit more basic here. We've now gotten onto the topic of the bad design of the human eye, which is different from whether or not it could have evolved from something simpler. And if I may, I'd like to stop you there for just a second and ask this question. Is it true then we can see examples of all stages of the evolved eye currently in nature from the single cell to the complex right now? That's what I was saying. Yes. And in fact, okay. you can find pictures of it in my book. So people who are using the argument that the eye cannot have evolved. You are providing specific examples, and I'll link to the book, of course, in the description box of this show and get it out there on social media. But we can look and see evolution happening and the examples of the evolved eye right now. It's not so much evolution happening as it is examples of eyes of all degrees of complexity okay. that are alive and working today. And they all benefit the organisms that have them. So, right. and that's the standard for evolution is that most of the time you're better off with it than without it. Though the real standard for evolution, I must emphasize, is good enough to not kill you before reproduction too much of the time. I think Dr. Eugenie Scott said uh, something about instead of survival of the fittest, sometimes it's survival of the fit enough, right? Right. Adequate is the name of the game here. Um, but getting on to the bad design of the human eye, um, this is where teaching human anatomy and physiology comes in so handy again. Because one time I was doing a laboratory on eyes, and we had a wonderful, wonderful uh, photo micrograph of the human retina. So a very, very close up of the human retina. And there was a little diagram at the top showing the pathway of light and then where the photoreceptors are and all of this kind of thing. And it was really great. And I looked at it and I had my students look at it and I said, what's wrong with this picture? And if you look at it for really not that long, you see the problem. And that is that the pathway that the light coming in and heading towards the photoreceptors, the pathway of the light actually goes through and past the fibers from those photoreceptors. Remember, these are cells that are going to get the information on the light and then send that information by way of nerve fibers to the optic nerve and then on to the brain. So you have to have these nerve fibers. And the light actually has to go through the nerve fibers and through some blood vessels and through some helper cells before the light actually gets to the photoreceptors, which are kind of at the bottom of the retina instead of at the top where you or I would place photoreceptors if we were designing an eye. And the analogy that I make is to try and imagine a camera that is so poorly designed that all of the wires of the camera are put between the lens and the imaging chip so that all of the shadows from all of the wires are on all of your pictures. And then basically you have to do a whole lot of Photoshopping and processing before you can get sort of semi-usable images. And that is the case with our eyes. The light has to go past all of these nerve fibers and all of these helper cells and all of these blood vessels before it gets to the photoreceptors. That's not a design. That is not the way anybody thinking about making a visual system would work. Putting preventable flaws into a visual system is not the sign of an intelligent conscious designer. So is the brain compensating? Is it filling in the blanks, so to speak? Oh, yeah. All the time. There is so much image processing that goes on in our visual system. Now, by contrast, 
squid and cuttlefish and octopuses, all of those particular uh, animals known as cephalopods, they all have eyes with the wiring, the, the nerve fibers behind the photoreceptors. So they have eyes that are wired better than ours. And it's a simple fix. It's the kind of thing that if God were consciously making eyes and there was a mistake made, it's like, oh, dear, I put all of the wires in front of the light. That's just a bad idea. You know, could we not have sort of gotten a factory recall and had our eyes rewired so that the photoreceptors were on top? Clearly, it's possible. It's what squid got. Which leads us to the question of who does God like better, us or squid? <laughs> I don't want to know the answer to that one. I don't want to know. <laughs> or um, maybe it's that squid were made in God's image. You never know. So if we, you know, if, if I had the eye of a squid, I mean, I realize these are adaptations to environment in many cases, but I, or in all cases, perhaps. But it's so ironic to be talking about the perfectly designed eye when we are surrounded by vision correction technology to fix a very serious problem. We're nearsighted, we're farsighted, we have cataracts, we have all of these corrective procedures like LASIK and whatnot. We are constantly having to try to fix what allegedly is perfectly designed. Right, absolutely. People have astigmatisms, all kinds of things, and those are in eyes that are basically working as well as they could. So it's not a case of an eye that was, say, injured. Yeah. I mean, yeah. our own eyes are imperfect just in the sense that many people have to wear corrective lenses and all of our eyes get worse with age. But even outside of all of that is just the fact that the just plain layout of the eye is bad. Short break. When I come back, we're going to continue our conversation about examples of not so intelligent design in the human body and elsewhere. So Keep taking notes. Be right back to continue the conversation after this. Before I heard about simple contacts, if you had told me I could do a basic vision test and contact lens prescription renewal at my own computer in about five minutes for 20 bucks, I'm not sure I would have believed you. But it's real. It is awesome. It's vision care for the 21st century. There's simply no faster or easier way to renew your contact lens prescription and order your contacts. It's a huge time and money saver, especially considering that you're not torching half a day and maybe 200 bucks on the eye appointment. Simple Contacts has licensed ophthalmologists that review every exam carefully. You get your eye prescription updated, and then Simple Contacts provides all the brands of contact lenses you are familiar with, so you can just click and take advantage of their competitive prices. And if you need options for astigmatism or multifocal lenses, colored lenses, no problem. If your prescription's already current, no problem. Just upload that info to Simple Contacts, and you can order immediately. Now, obviously, this is not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. But if your vision hasn't changed, Simple Contacts is the way to go. There is a reason they have over 3,000 five-star reviews on the App Store. And right now, you can get $30 off your contacts when you use this URL. Go to simplecontacts.com slash Seth Andrews, and then use the promo code Seth Andrews. Experience vision care for the 21st century and get $30 off right now at simplecontacts.com slash Seth Andrews. Promo code Seth Andrews. My patrons get this show commercial free, 100% commercial free, and a bonus broadcast just for them every month. Thanks for your support. If you'd like to sign up on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Seth Andrews, and you can just determine the level of support you want to give. Continuing now, my conversation with Dr. Abby Hafer, a conversation that's based on the title of her book, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. Anything else in the body of note of interest, uh, the human body or elsewhere, that you think points to poor design? There are lots and lots of examples. If you want to get back to reproductive systems, there's the female reproductive system. There's the genome itself. There's the appendix. I mean, there's the human throat. Actually, I'm going to go with that. Okay. For the simple reason that it is G-rated and easy to understand, and, <laughs> and everybody has the experience. 
All right. Um, so the point is, this is one that, you know, if there are elementary school teachers who are listening, this is one that can be used in fourth grade, for instance, because this is something that everybody kind of has some experience with. So there are two tubes in the throat. There's the windpipe known as the trachea, which is in front. And then there's the, the esophagus, which is part of your digestive system. It leads to the stomach in the back. Now, our mouths, of course, can take in food and we swallow food and the food gets diverted into the esophagus leading to the stomach. We also breathe with our mouths and our noses and the air winds up going into our windpipe, the trachea, right? Yep. Now, the problem here is that those two tubes, the trachea and the esophagus, they have this common entry area in the part of the throat known as the pharynx. And when we are swallowing, there is a flap of cartilage that lies down on top of the windpipe so that the food actually gets diverted further back into the esophagus leading to the stomach. Same thing with water that we swallow. When we swallow, this thing happens. That's terrific, right? Except then the thing is, when we are not swallowing, that flap of elastic cartilage flaps back up so that the windpipe is open so we can breathe. But the thing is, because we have these two tubes in our throat, it means that we can inhale our food, literally inhale it, and we can then die of asphyxiation. This happens all the time. Hospital emergency rooms and all kinds of places are full of people who have had this problem. What happens is somebody is, let's say, having a good conversation with a friend while they are eating. Maybe they're not chewing as carefully as they should. They're having a great conversation. They're eating steak or they're eating hot dogs or something like that. And they take a breath and the food gets sucked into the windpipe when they inhale. And then it gets stuck there blocking breathing. At that pro point, that person has a few minutes to live. Not a very good design, I would Not say. Not a very good design if food can get vacuumed into your windpipe that easily. And what's more, and this is what I always try to do in my book, is show other animals that got better versions of the same general layout. Marine mammals like whales have that blowhole on top. That blowhole is really its nostrils, and the whale's respiratory system is completely separate from its digestive system, so it can't. It literally cannot choke on its food by inhaling it, whereas you and I can, and nearly everybody has had the experience at some point or another of inhaling cracker crumbs or inhaling a gnat or something like that, so you know that you can wind up with the wrong thing going down your windpipe and it feels pretty bad. And there are a lot of people who die that way every single year. And it's just a bad design. And those deaths would be so preventable if we just had two completely different tubes, two completely different systems for digestion and respiration. And as I said, cetaceans, whales and dolphins got that and we didn't. So again, who does God like better, you know, us or whales? I was talking to a friend and biologist and geologist, uh, Dr. Donald Prothero, mm -hmm. and he brought up a great example since we're talking about the throat and the animal kingdom of the giraffe that has this laryngeal nerve that really should only have to go about, I guess, 12 inches. I mean, you're the zoologist, you tell me, but instead it travels like all the way down the neck and then it wraps around and comes all the way back up and has to cover like, what, a dozen feet, 14 feet. It's not an efficient design, so to speak. Yeah, that is one part of one nerve. And what happens is that in all of us, the nerve goes from the brain and then basically to the larynx, which is if you can find your Adam's apple, you found your larynx. And in all of us, it takes this peculiar side trip, which when we were shaped differently, you know, just sort of happened and it made sense at the time. But as we grew and got necks and things like that, it makes less and less sense, but it's still there. What happens is that in all of us, it goes from the brain and then it actually loops down to the heart and goes under one artery that comes out of the heart and then comes back up to the larynx. 
So we've got that same bad system, but it's more weirdly obvious in giraffes simply because whereas for us, that nerve makes an unnecessary trip of, let's say, two feet between our brain and our heart and then the round trip back up to the larynx. Call it about two feet of nerve tissue that we don't really need to have. But of course, in a giraffe with that monumentally long neck, now you're talking about several yards of unnecessary nerve fiber when it would be a lot simpler to just have that nerve go directly from the brain to the larynx, but we don't get that and neither do giraffes. That's just kind of a weird one. I don't think that it really harms anybody in any way. It's just weird. It's just Um, weird and not exactly efficient. It's weird and definitely not efficient. (laughs) Okay. But as I said, you know, things like the bad design of the throat can kill us. Any other examples pop into your mind? I'm going to, of course, ask everybody to go and and support the book and use it as a resource. But uh, what do you think? Any others? I like to give equal time to men and women here. So I'll talk about the bad design of the human female reproductive system. Basically, the birth canal is way, way, way too small, which is why labor is so hard. And the reason for that is that we have big headed babies because we are very smart. But on the other hand, we walk on two legs. And if you're going to be a biped as we are, you need to have fairly narrow hips. If the legs are too far apart, it's much harder to walk and it's much less efficient to walk. So walking on two legs favors narrow hips. But on the other hand, giving birth to big-headed babies favors wide hips. That's just a bad system. And just about any woman who has given birth can tell you it's a bad system. Again, if you were an engineer and you were sitting down with some specifications, okay, I want a, a species that's really smart and it gives birth. So what are we going to do? Well, first of all, if we were really just being designed from a whiteboard, we could have been like the mythical centaurs with four legs on the ground and two hands and a head. And at that point, the size of the head would be less important because we could have wider hips and it would not be so awkward for walking if we had four legs. The other thing is, okay, let's say the specifications are, no, it's got to be a biped too, for whatever reason. If you're going to be a biped that is very, very smart, what we could have done, again, if we were being designed from you know specifications and using a whiteboard, is that we could reproduce the way kangaroos do, where they give birth to these tiny embryo-like young, which then come out of the female's birth canal when they are very, very small. As I said, they're basically embryos. And then they continue their development in a pouch on the outside of the mother's body. And there's the pouch has a nipple for nursing. And the kangaroo babies known as joeys are really, really tiny and embryo-like when they are born. And, you know, that's really the way to give birth if you're going to be a biped. And particularly if you're going to be a smart, large-headed biped. That would be so much easier, but we didn't get that. Give me just a a few more real fast, and I'd like to finish sort of on a a different note. But uh, any other examples that a not-so-intelligent designer would have been responsible for? Well, there's two. There's kind of the obvious one and the less obvious one. I'll talk about the obvious one first, which is the human appendix, which is an odd part of our digestive system. And it's particularly odd because it doesn't actually do anything useful. But it does occasionally explode and kill us. Um, So I call this, this is not just bad design. This is really, really bad design because we have this organ that has no function and yet it occasionally kills us for no reason. The appendix is always one to consider and people dream up all kinds of reasons for why the appendix is really good design, but they're just making up stories. <laughs> um, and I will be happy to explain the the reasons for why they're all stories, but it would, you know, that gets boring after a while. All night. Well, I mean, I right. was thinking, like, does anyone actually know what the appendix is for? Is it just a vestigial organ? It's a vestigial organ. It has utility in animals that digest cellulose, that digest wood. 
basically. So it's really, really helpful in animals like rabbits, but not in us. So again, why would God give us an organ that works best in rabbits? And when it malfunctions, causes us to die a horribly painful death. (laughs) Yeah, right, right, exactly. That's just not a good system. Another one that I like to get into that's a little bit less obvious but kind of horrific is the human genome itself. You know, all of those sequences of base pairs that make up our DNA and this kind of thing. Here's the part that is really, really weird. And I am not an expert on the genome, but I have read up on it. And we have some really weird parts of our genome. There are basically these areas in the genome that will, instead of just, you know, allowing themselves to be copied in a nice orderly fashion the way they're supposed to, they will occasionally make a copy of themselves, just independently of everything else. They make a copy of their own little short sequence and they pop that copy out. And then that copy can dive in anywhere else on your genetic sequence, no matter what it is breaking up or what it's interfering with or anything like this. And that's literally a part of our system. The way that our genome is put together is that it has these areas that just do this. And this would make no sense at all in a well-designed organism where you would want the copies to be perfect every time. And we do not make perfect copies all the time. That's why there are mutations. It's why people get cancer is because copying is not perfect all the time. It's why people get genetic diseases because copying is not perfect all the time. And there are lots of reasons why we get mutations, but it includes the fact that we have these sequences in our own genome that more or less generate mutations, whether we want them or not. And of course, in evolutionary terms, it makes sense because, you know, if somebody dies because of a horrible genetic disease, evolution does not care. But on the other hand, if it keeps generating these mutations, occasionally you'll get something which is beneficial and evolution will go in a slightly different direction. But creating life that occasionally dies a horrible death is not something that evolution thinks about because evolution doesn't think. Evolution doesn't plan. It's just all about reproducing. And every now and then, as I said, you have mutations and sometimes the mutations are beneficial. Sometimes they're kind of intermediate and sometimes they're terrible. But our own genome is sitting there imperfectly copying itself and it actually generates these mutations itself. For those who link complexity and design, do you hold to the claim that the best designs are the most simple and not the most complex? Well, if you're talking about conscious design, then, of course, what you're trying to do is going for the system that works best. And you want to do that sort of with as few moving parts as possible and as little complexity as possible because just fewer things to break down. But I don't quite know how that refers to living systems other than to say with something like the giraffe's neck, where you do have that nerve that goes on forever for no reason. That's just kind of an inefficiency. I think where I'm going with that is the claim that it's the complexity that proves a designer because there is so much going on. There is so much complexity to the system that many people say, well, this is proof of an intelligence that created the system. And so I have heard the refutation, well, actually, if there was an intelligence that created the system, they would have optimized the system. Well, I think that's true. Absolutely. You know, if you're going to make a, if you're going to give an engineer, for instance, some design specifications, this is what I want an organism to look like or do or be like, then you will generally go for the system that is the simplest. That's the one that is going to be the best. There are going to be the fewest breakdowns, the fewest other things that need to be done and the like. So indeed, a simple design is best when possible. And it is true that wickedly complex organisms, for instance, ourselves, that does not indicate a designer, for instance, our brains. One of the reasons why the brain is so hard to study is because there are all of these different feedback loops in it. 
And back in the bad old days when you had to study brains by sticking an electrode into a neuron and then, you know, playing sounds to it or something like to the animal and and hoping that you would get some kind of a readout from the neuron because we were trying to figure out sort of what sensations mapped to which parts of the brain. The problem there was that very often there are so many feedback loops and very often there would be parts of the brain that were right next to each other that did completely different things that, you know, it was really hard to study the brain that way. We do a lot better these days now that we have brain imaging where we can look at blood flow and things like this. But what I'm getting at here is that the brain has many layers of complexity. There are many different parts to the brain from parts that control our unconscious actions, for instance, all the actions of our digestive system and so on. That is all done in the part of the brain called the medulla. But there are also a lot of fibers that pass through the medulla going to other parts of the brain. And all of these things have feedback loops on feedback loops, including feedback loops to your hormonal system, your endocrine system. And it is very, very complicated in a way that you would not design something. It's a mess. It really is. <laughs> My brain's a mess for sure. I guarantee you. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. Well, let me turn this all on its ear real fast. You know, when I first became introduced to the avalanche of evidence for evolution, and I was a religious person, I remember, you know, it threatened my specialness and it was just, it just seemed so counterintuitive at first. I'm curious, what impressed you that, that kind of got you thinking about this? What was, what was the part of the avalanche that kind of stuck out for you? Well, it began with the death of creationism. As I saw, I took sort of a forensic look at the scriptures I had once assumed on faith, and I wanted them to start making sense. And so, you know, in that regard, the idea of Adam and Eve in the garden sort of fell away, the authorship of scripture, the the fact that the Bible was so unreliable, the verses and the stories, the claims, the promises, the prophecies all contradicted with each other or just didn't jive with the real world. And so the more I saw the Bible beginning to fall away, that was one of the first things. And mm -hmm. so it was like um, what Robert Green Ingersoll says, the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the truth. So as I moved all the Bible babble out of my life, I started to then read other books like Jerry Coyne's why evolution is true and others. Mm -hmm. And I just began to say, oh, wait, now I don't have to jam the square peg in the round hole anymore. This actually makes sense. Like the uh, eye began mm -hmm. to make sense. And, and this is kind of where I'm going with you is I, instead of being threatened by evolution, have become just so encompassed in awe and wonder about the processes of evolved life here on earth. Do you feel that? I'm sure as an educator and author, do you look around and go, holy shit, this is just amazing stuff. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's where it gets fun. And I'm even going to go a little bit further and say that to a large extent, that's why scientists get up in the morning. Or I should say at least why they go to work in the morning is because it is just so amazing and cool. And at some point they have had that sense of this is just such amazing stuff that, well, then they want to work on it and they want to find out more about it. And the way you find out more about it is not by making up stories, but by doing the actual research, doing the actual science. So absolutely. I mean, I think it's fabulous. This is why I often tell people that, you know, evolutionary biology is absolutely the most interesting subject in the entire world. Others may disagree. Um, <laughs> and the, the fact that the universe doesn't care if you exist, that doesn't bother you at all? Uh, we learn to live with it. Yeah. Um, you know, right, the universe doesn't care. In many ways, that's very freeing because you can say, okay, so I don't have to try and figure out what God's plan is for my life, and I don't have to figure out what the meaning of this event is. What was God trying to tell me by whatever it is that happened? It's just more like, what can I learn from it? What kind of meaning do I want to put into my life? It's a bit of responsibility because you have to decide for yourself, okay, if you want a meaningful life, how are you going to construct one? And that's a lot harder than having a calling, which is, you know, divinely called. Though I have gathered that very often there can be a real problem with people who feel that they need to find a calling, which is 
either they don't find one and they never know what to do, or they have a calling and it totally and completely doesn't work out because it's all in their imagination anyway. And I really think it's better if you just kind of realize that you're going to have to figure out the meaning of your life for yourself and do the best you can and, you know, learn from whatever mistakes you make and hopefully learn occasionally from the mistakes that other people make. And, you know, that's all that it is. And that it kind of, as you were saying, getting the whole God idea out of the way while it makes you more responsible for things, and that may not be comforting. On the other hand, it also means you don't have to fit a lot of square pegs into round holes. You don't have to figure out what the meaning was of some horrible thing that happened to you, for instance. You don't have to figure out why God gave you a child that was born with birth defects or something like that. You don't have to figure out what the meaning of that was. I'm going to link to your book in the description box, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. Dr. Hafer, you know, you talk about the need for scientists to not necessarily dumb down, but to teach and communicate to the general public in language where we can take the journey with you and get excited about learning. And from my perspective, you are that scientist. You're that person who's able to take complex notions and ideas and data, and you're able to sort of put it in a package that the rest of us can unwrap and enjoy. And I, I think you're a tremendous asset in what you do. I'm just a huge fan, and I'm honored that you would join me for this broadcast. So thank you for your time and your wonderful work. Thank you very much. Well, it is something that we're not trained to do, so it's not actually easy to step out of the scientist box and retrain yourself to speak and to write in a different way. Um, but on the other hand, it's pretty fun to do. And I will just put in a plug, actually, for people who teach at community colleges or people who teach adult education or this kind of thing. That's where I got my start was in adult education. And I realized that I was dealing with people who were smart and motivated and completely unprepared for science. And so I couldn't assume that they knew anything. It was not a matter of dumbing things down, but it was a matter of figuring out how to explain things in very clear language. And that, I think, was a very worthy thing to do. And I suspect that, you know, if you go to your local community college or you take an adult education course, you may find other people who have also learned that skill. And it's a really good and useful skill to have. Dr. Abby Haver, it's been a real joy. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com